really 80% of my job is enabling people to feel happy in their skin and to forget that I'm taking the picture. Welcome to the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of She Clicks, which is a community for female photographers. In these podcasts, I talk to women in the photographic industry to hear about their experiences, what drives them and how they got to where they are now. This episode features Carolyn Mendelssohn, an artist and portrait photographer based in the UK. Her work is rooted in telling stories and amplifying the voices of those who are not always heard. Her passion is to be able to connect and communicate with people of all ages and backgrounds. She's recognised for her portraits, including her series and book, Being In Between. She's also the founder of Through Our Lens, a workshop and mentoring programme that enables people to tell their stories through the medium of photography. In addition to all that, Carolyn is an ambassador for Nikon Europe and the Royal Photographic Society. Hi, Carolyn. Welcome to the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. It's great to see you. Lovely to see you, Angela. I'm delighted to have been invited to talk today. Oh, well, I was always going to invite you because, you know, every time we've met, we've always got so much to say to each other. So hopefully we'll manage to keep it on track. Yeah, I hope so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> like quite a few photographers that I know, you didn't actually start out with photography as your career, did you? You went through a career change. So how did that come about? So um, initially, I was actually working in theatre as an actor and director and making films and doing big arts events as well, projections. I was always a creative and I was always a storyteller. And then what happened is my my life changed and I moved. I had three small children. It's, it's as if they suddenly appeared. <laughs> what happened really was my lifestyle changed. I could no longer do the kind of work and do the kind of traveling that I was doing before. And I had moved to a completely different place. And so I felt incredibly isolated. I wasn't sure who I was anymore because I'd always defined myself as being a creative and an artist. And suddenly I was seen as a parent, which is all fine. I'm not, I haven't got a problem with that, but it's a big part of me, my, my creative side. How I started with photography is interesting because I never wanted to be a photographer. My whole family took photos all the time. I have lots of photographers in my family. And um, my husband thought it would be a great idea to buy me a camera. So he bought me a camera, a, a lovely, I think it was a Nikon D70. And I just ignored it and I put it under my bed because I thought, well, I'm not a photographer and I don't want to take photos. So this beautiful camera was lying under my bed for quite a long time. And then, and I was running around with babies and, and small children. And then one day I thought, oh, wow, I, I, I should pick it up. So I picked it up. And it was like I had this complete epiphany, Angela. It was like, hold on. I've been really ignoring photography. I've been thinking it's invasive. It's not for me. It's not my art form but it felt really comfortable in my hands. And I realized that I could tell stories in my own, I tend to say like in my own square meter, I didn't have to be running around and I could use it as a tool to tell stories, to be creative, to find that part of me again. So I didn't, even at that point, I wasn't intending on it being a career, but I absolutely got drawn in. I was so obsessed. So I was busy taking photographs, playing. I joined Flickr. I was getting lots of responses. And it's a wonderful thing, digital photography, because I just kept on learning new things. So that's the very start of my photography journey. And and what was it that initially made you think photography wasn't the thing for you? Was it the fact that you had so many relatives who were really into it and you just kind of thought, oh, well, that's their thing. It's not my thing. Or was there something else to it? I think that was partly it. Um, The other thing was that I I had always absolutely loved working in theatre and film and that was my thing. And I channeled myself from being, you know, like a small child into that's what I wanted to do. Um, I think with photography, I had um, my family were obsessively documenting our lives. Every moment of, of our lives, you know, there were four kids and every moment was a camera would be in our face. And I never felt comfortable with it. So I think that was part of it. I saw it as a kind of invasive thing, not a beautiful, wonderful thing. And now, obviously, my parents um, 
have hundreds of albums and say so I look through them and I think well actually it is interesting and not only did they have hundreds of albums my grandparents had hundreds of albums my great grandparents took photographs I mean they they were you know almost right at the beginning of the history of photography we have amazing records photographic records that were taken by my my great grandparents great uncle you know so so yeah it's in my blood but it yeah yeah i didn't want it <laughs> <laughs> i think it's, it's a really interesting transition from film photography to digital photography say when you had a roll of film you had 24 or 36 exposures and i don't know about you but i cherished all those exposures so i think well, up until the point I learned about bracketing exposures, but you know, you, you used every frame that you had. And like when I had a photo album, I put all of those 36 pictures in the album, regardless of any kind of quality control, whether they were good or bad. But with digital photography, because we can shoot so much, yes, I do print a heck of a lot less, but I'm much more selective about it. And I'm more selective about sharing, which I think, you know, perhaps we've educated ourselves a little bit there. I think so. I think... Um... It's really easy with a digital camera just to not look properly. And um, though I didn't use a stills camera, I did obviously, I went on holiday, I took a little camera, I had 36 exposures. And, and so sometimes I will go back to film to slow myself down. And I think there's a wonderful thing about digital in that you can make mistakes, but also it stops people from really slowing down and looking at their work. And I think I was very aware of that, that you have a tool in your hands and it's a tool that can be used to communicate, to tell stories. So though we have hundreds of pictures, I like to think of myself as a considered photographer. <laughs> you know, I, I look properly down my lens and I think about the pictures I'm going to take. <laughs> How did you then move from being, you know, you accepted that perhaps photography had something for you as a hobbyist, but how did you then move to be a professional photographer? My journey is kind of surreal when I think about it. I was, I, like I was saying, I, I was obsessed. I'd be looking after the children, but also spending 10 hours a day photographing, learning about post-processing. I got so much joy from it. And I, I still didn't ever intend on being pro professional, it was just a tool to me at that point, a beautiful tool that I could play with and learn from and create beautiful, lovely, pretty pictures with. And I remember getting a following on Flickr and um, because I played with the pictures, I used lots of textures. I, I mean, it's nothing like the work I do now, apart from the fact there was always a kind of story behind it. Um, and then there was, a, I remember on Flickr, there was this advert a Channel 4 wanted to make a program with Flickr looking for the next emerging digital photographers. And um, I'd only really been taking photographs for under a year. And I thought, oh, I may as well apply for that. <laughs> and, and also, I the other thing was I could only use auto. I, I didn't really know how to use my camera. I, I, I knew how to frame and make beautiful work, but I had no idea how this tool works that I was using to do this. Um, so it was just really a punt. And then I got through to the final 300. And then I went down to London and there was an audition. And I remember I was terrified because there were producers, we were being filmed. I, I was hiding, thinking they're going to see that I can't use my camera. <laughs> and I was sitting next to like graduates and documentary photographers and fashion photographers, and we were given different things to do. And then I think I got down in, in that, it was like an audition, I guess, because it was a reali reality arts program that they were making. The producers talked to me in that I had to put a little portfolio together. They really loved the work. And then um, I went home and I got a phone call saying you're in the final 12. And I was like, <gasps> that was like shocking, but exciting because I was thinking, well, that's great. I got into the final 12 out of 3,000. That's pretty good going. But I had to go back to London to kind of um, meet the producers and also had to have a psychological evaluation. Oh, good grief. And uh, because it was a reality. Yeah, I know. It's mad, isn't it? So it was because it was a, re <laughs> it was a reality program. And it was at the time when Big Brother was huge and Opportunity was on. 
and and so they were thinking this could be massive and we don't you know obviously people have things they don't want the world to know then um, we need to know about them but um, I passed that luckily and um, then I got a, <laughs> I got a phone call telling me I was I'd been selected and I remember the producer um, Tom McDonald who um, said right I've, I've got great news, Carolyn. You've been. We want you to be on the program. You're in our final six, and I, Angela, I was silent because I thought I was going to be sick. I felt I was horrified. I was, <laughs> I was totally horrified and totally unprepared. At, but you know, I, I'm a risk taker, I guess. Yeah. And I step into things that I'm completely petrified about. So I thought, well, maybe I should just do it. But it was terrifying. That was my start. Yeah. So we had to like go into a studio and I took a, um, I met Jermaine Greer. I had to take a portrait of her and I, you know, had to use lights. I'd never used those before. But the thing I've always, I think my strength, and I think that goes from those, from right at the beginning to now, is that I'm good with people and that I have, um, an eye so I've always been able to compose and connect with people so I just use that um but yeah out of my comfort zone and it was a really amazing experience but it was totally terrifying yeah and then you know went went back and this was in 2007 they filmed that and then it was out in 2008 and then of course it's all over the internet and it's like that woman that woman with the three kids, because I was introduced as Carolyn Mendelssohn, mother of three. I was so angry. <laughs> I was like, hold on a second. <laughs> so it was like, you know, she doesn't even hold her camera right. So there was all these kind of comments. But it was fine because it actually taught me, you know, you you take your picture in the way you take your picture. I still, um, I think I still look a little awkward when I hold my camera so I don't think, I think you do it in a way that's comfortable to you. Martin Parr was one of the judges. And so like there were the top contemporary photographers, Brett Rogers from the Photographers Gallery. I thought it was going to be Hallmark cards, in which case I would have been fine. And I think what it made me do was I thought, right, no one's ever going to be able to say that I don't know my camera. So I then went on another learning curve to learn my camera inside out. To, to kind of, I realized that lenses were the thing that help you create beautiful portraits. So I just, I parred back all my work at that time as well. I had been using um, textures and Photoshop. I thought, right, I'm going to go back to the beginning. And that's what I did. But I started to be invited to do commissions. Still not, I, it was still way out of my comfort zone. I still didn't see myself as potentially a professional photographer, but because I, had this exposure um, and I was all still taking lots of work and I was pushing myself in terms of my own craft, I started to get commissions, mainly kind of portraits and lifestyle at that point. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, most people, you know, someone who's commissioning or, or looking for photographs, they're not photographers and they're not going to look at it and think, oh, well, she's quite clearly shot that at f5.6 rather than 2.8 or whatever. They just look at what they just look at the picture and think, do I like it? Do I like this work? Do I not like this work? And if you are good at composition, it doesn't matter whether you've shot it on auto or aperture priority or manual, does it? It's you, you know you've got to get the creative side or the storytelling side done first. And I actually know I'm not going to name any names, but I know um, one photojournalist who always used to put tape over his camera so that so the so the settings didn't change. You know, he just kept it all the same. Um, and but. He was great at composing an image. Absolutely. And it's learning how to use light as well. Because, you know, I know we always say photography is light. I was always good at kind of looking at where the light was and, and creating a story with my work. So even if I was, even if it was a lifestyle shot, I'd be thinking, I want to make a story with this picture. I want to create a portrait that's really powerful. I, I really wanted to create work, even at an early stage, that drew people in that told a story of that person. And I think I I learned quite quickly really how to use manual and how to use um, and what lenses to get. And that just kind of pushed me further. But interestingly, I was, you know, I was doing all these commissioned work 
So I guess I was working professionally. I didn't feel comfortable with it though, Angela, at that point, really. Mm. So what was it that made you feel comfortable? Was it basically exposure therapy? You, you know, these people keep coming to me and asking me to do work or was it, was, was there something else? Was there a, a pivotal moment where you suddenly understood everything or something? Well, I think I did understand it, but I think it was more that I wanted to do my own stuff. So I wanted to tell my own stories. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you become, you you serve people as a photographer. And I, I do that in my commissioned commercial work. Now you serve people, you serve the assignment, you serve um, the company or the individual. But I think at that point, because I had been, you know, going back to my life in theatre and film, I had been creating stories that were my own or, or directing and and kind of looking at how I wanted something to be. It was the creative control. And I think with commissions, often you're like in at the deep end, have to establish relationships with people really quickly. I love it when I'm there. You know, I do love it when I'm actually taking those portraits. But but it was like I found I found it very stressful. And people are always surprised. And I still do actually, I still do find assignments really full of kind of stress because I'm a perfectionist I want them to be brilliant and I want to so I kind of overthink them and um, and I think what happened was so that I, let's let's move on you know a few years I was doing uh, lots of lifestyle I was doing families I was also documenting my family's life in the same way that my parents documented our lives but kind of differently I guess more artistically so I have a whole series called The Family Document where people will know if they know my work, they've probably followed my children from zero to like 18, 19. And um, that's how I honed my craft really. And I think, I remember it was an autumn and I think my daughter Poppy must have been about seven. And I was just about off to do an autumn shoot in the woods. And she was sitting there with her... Um, her book on her lap and a bookmark and the light on her face was extraordinary and beautiful and I had my camera on me and I remember thinking I've got to take her picture and I had her like 135 lens and I took her picture I, I said Poppy she looked at me and I took her picture the light was so beautiful though and then I rushed off to do this kind of autumn shoot in the woods with the family and um, I remember at that point, so that would have been um, 2012, maybe. So I'd been going for quite a while. I remember thinking, I don't know whether I want to do this anymore. I have lost the joy. That's the thing we have. It's so joyful when you start, isn't it? And it's so easy to kind of lose that joy, I think. Um, and so I'd lost the joyfulness of, of photography. And I remember thinking with the photograph that I took of Poppy, that I would send it out into the universe. I'd send it out there because I love that picture. And if something came back, then maybe I should continue doing it. And um, so I sent, I remember applying to professional photographer of the year and I sent that off in the lifestyle section and then it won. And I was, I, I'm very emotional. So I sobbed yeah. and cried because I couldn't quite believe it. And, and then I, I remember thinking, oh, maybe I should be doing this. Maybe I should. And I remember another thing my husband John said to me, because I used to always um, change, always stop doing things and find something new to do because I needed change, I needed challenges, I needed excitement. And I remember him saying to me, so now that you've proven you can, you can take portraits and you're a great photographer, are you going to stop? And I looked at him. And I went, how dare you? <laughs> so, so I went, of course I'm not. So, so it kind of really propelled me. And, and really, I then started doing a lot more personal work. And I think that's what brought me the joy back. It, it was the mixing personal projects um, where I could use my camera as a tool to explore, explore the world I was living in with the commercial work and then it, it came back really. So basically your personal work gives you that sense of purpose that you need to continue with photography. Yeah, it really does. It, it, it gives me a purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And what sort of clients do you have now for your commercial work? I mean, do you do still photograph other families or, you, you know, do you work more for companies and organisations? So I, I think I'm quite fortunate now in that I do work that has meaning to me. So I don't tend to do families anymore. I, um, I do individual portrait commissions. I also am free. I'm a freelance photojournalist for Bloomberg News, so I get all sorts of exciting opportunities with them. I do some, you know, I haven't for a while, but I do some fashion work, and also because of my personal projects, I guess we may well talk about in a little while. That work became very well known, and I have. Um, I'm getting work based on my personal work, so it almost feels like so I'm artist in residence for this organization doing the kind of work that I was doing in my personal work which is wonderful um, and then I also get art commissions to create new bodies of work so it's a real mixture and the other thing the other kind of work I really do enjoy commission wise is documenting artists so taking portraits of artists documenting their work um, I love doing that because I just go and visit them I, um, we have lots of chats and, and it's almost like I feel very comfortable with that. I, we find the beautiful light. I follow their process. I take those portraits and that makes me happy. So those kind of commissions are very joyful. So if a client comes to you, do you have lots of questions for them or is it that they've already connected with your photography and they kind of want you to go with it so they say we'd like some photographs of this person or this this event and they leave it to you or do you have lots of questions for them to sort of nail down exactly what they want I always have lots of questions I don't I don't tend to do events so I would say I'm definitely more of a specialist portrait photographer um but because I'm wanting to make sure that I create the best work for them so you know and for myself as a photographer I want to know about the assignment they're giving me. And um, sometimes it can be way out of my comfort zone and I'll even try to put them off, which I have done before. I said, oh no, I'm too busy, I can't do that. And they go, okay, and then they'll come back. And that's usually because there's like a celebrity or a famous person, I'm thinking, oh, I don't know, I, I, I don't feel comfortable. And then they change the time so I can do it. And then I think, oh, okay, right, you know, get over yourself, Carolyn, <laughs> get over yourself. And I think, um, I, so, but I always have, so if it's a private, a private, a, a commission, then I always, um, have a consultation with that person. So I, either on Zoom or in real life, I want to find out all about them. I want to find out about what they would love, what their, what their vision is. And then I can share what my vision might be. And um, because I don't, you know, I don't want to just go in and do my stuff. I want to know exactly who they are and exactly what they love and exactly how we can work together for the best results. So I always do that. And I think with the more commercial assignments, I, I still do it, actually. Yeah. I need to know the kind of location. I need to know who's involved. I need to know if it's for an editorial, for example, I need to know the kind of spread, if it's like a story spread, if they want words to be printed on it so I kind of need to know all those details with and so I kind of always do my research yeah you are a bit of a planner then I am which is really bizarre because I'm quite chaotic as a human being so (laughs) so, I'm like it's not that I'm chaotic because that's that's me you know putting myself down a bit but I'm I'm not a neat and tidy person um I attract things, I collect things, but I think when it comes to kind of creating work, then I, to feel comfortable, I need to make sure that I have everything planned. And if I have everything planned, then um, (laughs) I can kind of feel comfortable. I can chuck that plan away and I can fly. If that makes sense. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it it does. It's, it's, I mean, you're, you're, it's a serious business, isn't it? You know, it could be fun. But actually, you want to portray someone's story, so you need to understand their story first before you can do that. If, you know, if you just kind of rocked up and and didn't know anything about them, just kind of that, oh well, this place will do. You're not going to get the result that either of you want. Yeah, you're not. And it's interesting because some 
some commissions, I have no idea what the location is going to be like. So, for example, I was commissioned by the Royal Photographic Society in the Imperial War Museum to create portraits of Holocaust survivors called, it was a piece of work called Generations. Um, and they're the very elderly and amazing people that I met to take their portraits that said something about who they were and their lives and their amazing stories and their generations after them. And so I remember Hannah Kadai was one of, one of the women I took pictures of. I talked to her on the phone. I went to where she lived, which is in the Dales. And um, I brought all my equipment with me. But the most important thing was for me to kind of get to know her a bit. Mm. And so I remember taking all these pictures and then I also took my lighting equipment with me and I did stuff outside. We talked about what she might wear. I remember on the phone, I said, what, what are you going to wear? You know, we need something that works. And she chose her favorite dress. And then I, I'm always thinking of my feet because I wanted, I did four portraits of four different people and I wanted something to connect those portraits together. They're up in the Imperial War Museum at the moment. So I remember thinking if there can be an item from their early years, like a photograph or or something that's important to them, that it that reflects each photograph that I take, then that will work. But I remember that the end portrait I took with Hanukkah was actually inside with natural light. We were really comfortable and I couldn't really plan that. I had to kind of think on my feet and I had to go with, I had to trust that I have the skills to put her at her ease, take a picture that tells her story, um, but also connects her with the audience. So it's a real mixture how I how I work when I think about it. I hadn't actually realised that that was a commissioned work. And I think that shows how well it fits within your personal work because it just, you know, it's definitely your photography. It was an amazing opportunity. It was, there was myself and I think 12 other photographers and some world famous photographers were selected to do this piece of work. Um, and uh, it, we were actually invited to create something that really was how we saw that person. So using our own personal style, really. So that I think that was part of it. I think a lot of my work does feel like my work, even if it's a kind of assignment because I bring myself and my the way I communicate my techniques and the kind of lenses I use and the light that I like to all the projects really. Mm. And with your personal work I mean where does the inspiration come from for that? I think initially going right back to the beginning I want to find out about stuff so I remember I got my 85 1.4 lens a couple of years into my photography journey Honestly, what a beautiful lens. And I discovered how you could do that depth of field. And it was such a beautiful, wonderful portrait lens. And so I had this little personal project, which was me stopping everyone I knew, even strangers, to take a picture of their face. So, so it was like, number one, that was kind of technical, but also because I was obsessed with faces. And then, um, you know, moving on to other personal work, I was making a film for... Um, a festival in Hexham, actually. So I was invited to make this film that was going to be projected in the Abbey. So even though I was, you know, really well into my photography journey, I was still doing a bit of the work I used to do. And whilst I was there, I saw all these independent traders in Hexham. And I remember thinking, I want to take their pictures. You know, there was the butcher, there was the clock mender, there was the luthier, there was, there, there was the jewellery maker... Um, and there was the, the shoe bar man. And so I, that was a personal project. And I just remember thinking about those Victorian pictures of shopkeepers. So I, I went in and kind of saw these people. I said, oh, I'd love to take your portrait. And I had a little wobbly light on the stand, a, a flash actually through an umbrella. I arranged him to kind of spend an hour with them. And so that work... Um, was really well received it was personal work and then they invited the the kind of council invited me back the year after to continue it and then exhibited it so you know projects like bigger projects like being in between that piece of work 
it's a personal project which is about girls aged between 10 to 12 and it um, is about taking their portrait in a way that amplifies them gives them agency so I wanted them to choose what clothes to wear and then I interview them about their lives I wanted the that work to almost be like it could be to be lit in a way that it looked like a an old master it could, it could be in an art gallery so that was my kind of in my head but the reason I did that wasn't because I thought oh that'll be interesting it was because I was so connected to that age myself I had really strong memories of being 10 11 and 12 and um, how uncomfortable I felt and I was, suddenly I felt so self-conscious after being quite free-spirited, how I felt I wasn't pretty, how I felt things that people said to me were true, and all those kind of big existential thoughts I had in my head that I felt I couldn't talk to anyone about, which happens when you're that. Not to everyone, but it happened to me. And um, I, I just thought, actually, why is it that things that people say to you at that age become how you see yourself? Because that's not a great thing. And and then I thought, I want to kind of explore this age and actually celebrate it. It's People see it as an awkward age. So I'd have, oh, yes, it's such an awkward stage. And I thought, no, it's a really amazing, transient part of life. So that body of work that took me six years to complete in my own time um, was kind of really about myself. It was, I remember somebody saying to me, Somebody said, why are you just doing girls? And it really wound me up. I said, because I was a girl and it's, it's about me. And then somebody else who was an academic went, Carolyn, it's auto-ethnographic. So I've learned these big words that I can use. Um, but that work was fundamental in terms of my career development. And I think I suddenly was driven to just continuing with it and people really loved it and it was exhibited at quite an early stage I showed a gallery some of the work they were we love it can you exhibit the work and I'd only taken six portraits so I thought oh right so I think about eight months later they showed the work and it was a harping back to my theatre days I used sound and I created a soundscape and then um, that work was seen and shared and it was in on BuzzFeed, it was in um, it was in Huffington Post, and I just continued it, and it was exhibited in other places. But the the major turning point for me as a photographic artist was when I entered it for the um, Royal Photographic Society International Print Exhibition, and my picture of Alice won the gold, which was a major thing for me. Um, again, I sobbed, but this time I sobbed really like somebody had died. It was my poor kids at home were like, oh, what's wrong? I was going, I've won, a, I've won this huge competition. But what it meant was was that, um, was that that work was then seen in the Sunday Times. It was taken seriously suddenly by curators and art galleries and the contemporary photography world. So that was like the start of doing work that really resonated with myself as well as with other people. You, you said that, you know, it started to be taken seriously by others. Did it change in your mind too? Did you start to see it more seriously? Or has it always been serious? Um, and then you were just started to get recognition for it. I think I was always serious about it. Um, I kind of went into it really wanting to create powerful work. I didn't expect people to love that work. It's always a bit of a risk when you share personal work. But I really, I really wanted to explore this. And I wanted, it wasn't, though I say it was kind of based on my memory, it was about me. It was actually about giving those young people, those girls, a space and a platform. And every time it was seen, I would cheer because I would think they're being seen. They're being listened to. People aren't ignoring them. They aren't being marginalized. And So I always took it seriously. I was just so surprised that the world started taking it seriously as well. Because I think I'm always expecting people to say, oh, no, you know. Yeah. But I didn't really let any of those voices stop me because I felt it. And then then I started to get kind of mentors from the photography world who would say, keep it going. You know, people, galleries and curators and, and 
And so it's really weird because because if you think about it, I could have kind of stopped it at a really early stage, but I just kept it going. And it's hard to keep a project like that going over a long period of time because there are points where you lose the, where I lost the plot. Yeah. And I think, why am I doing this? You know, so... <laughs> But uh, those the girls, you know, you interviewed them and and, and wrote or, or, or recorded them. Some of the things they said, you know, about their aspirations or their concerns were really interesting. And they, you know, they resonated probably with about fifty percent of the population, um, you know, and they are able to connect. But also, you know, some of them are very very insightful. Yeah, it's amazing. I w- I really believe if you give people the space and you ask them questions, I'd be given the space to answer. Then pe- then everyone is surprising. And you know, it's interesting that the 50% of the population, actually, it was all generations, all genders who, I didn't expect this, who related to that work in some way because they saw themselves in it <laughs> or they saw their um, children or grandchildren in it or, or they saw their younger selves in it. It was really fascinating to do that. Mm. And, um, you know, that project itself, obviously I've done lots of other things, but that project itself lent, um, then um, I became I, I I got commissioned to do very similar work. I I'm artist in residence for a for Age of Wonder at the moment. This is a huge health study, and I'm working with 12 to 14 year olds. So it's all on my Instagram. I'm taking in a very similar way, taking their their portraits and interviewing them and asking them about their hopes and fears. And this is part of a huge international. Um, internationally recognized health research project. Obviously, I'm only a tiny bit of it, but I give the face to the work that the scientists are doing. But what a joy, actually. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what a, what a fantastic um, opportunity for them and you. But would you be tempted to go back and photograph the girls from being in between, you know, when they're five years older or 10 years older or anything? Um, I think... What was really, con- what it's it's really interesting that because I think we all kind of want to know what the end of the story is. No. But that, uh, for me, the point of that piece of work was that particular time. And so I, I won't say I'll never go back, but they're a real spread of ages, those girls. Yeah. Um, I think it would be, ad- it would be really hard to administer. But what I would really love is if one of those girls becomes a photographer and then decides to take it on. That would just feel quite poetic. <laughs> but there might be something else that comes from that, that, you know, the fact that you listened to them and, and it was written down somewhere what they actually said, you know, perhaps they had concerns about the environment or something like that. And, you know, they might become an environmental scientist or something because somebody actually listened to their concerns and, and agreed that it was something we should be worried about. You know, it could be, have all sorts of repercussions, I guess. I think so. But also, you know, a lot they're all in the book. There is a book of that work. Yeah. It's been exhibited. And I think it's just giving them a space to express those things. And it did change some of their lives. It literally changed their trajectory from being self-conscious and worried to feeling very proud and empowered. So that is um, a great feeling, really. That kind of brings me nicely onto my next question, which is what impact has being a Nikon ambassador had on you? I couldn't believe it, actually, Angela. (laughs) It was like, I I couldn't believe it when they said Carolyn. I I thought, so I've always been, I've always used Nikon and um, they kind of invited me to be, they were, I was a friend of theirs. So they said, you're our friend. (laughs) Would you like to talk at Photo London? And that was huge. <laughs> I was thinking, Photo London, I generally can't even afford to go. And here I am talking about, and they just wanted me to talk about my work and stories. And that was amazing. And so I would have this great relationship with them where they would invite me to do talks and presentations. And then um, and then they said, oh, would you like to be a creator? And I was like, oh, okay. And then after four months... They said, actually, we've been talking. I thought I'd get told off because I I just done a talk and I'm very open when I talk. And I thought, oh, I probably said the wrong thing. And they're probably, you know, they said, we'd like to chat to you. And they're probably going to say, Carolyn, really? Um, I'm not sure you can be a creator anymore. And they said, actually, we've been talking to the Europe team and we really love what you do we love your work we love the way you communicate and your enthusiasm and the quality of your photography would you like to be an ambassador and I, I, I could have this was done on zoom I could have like 
fallen. I literally almost fell off my chair. Um, and absolutely love that. I love that brand. I love the team Nikon. I love the Nikon family. So I think, you know, it's interesting. It feels a great fit for as long as it's there. It feels wonderful. I work in collaboration with them. I'm proud of it, but also it means that I can really use the being a Nikon ambassador to amplify other people's voices because that's what my work's about. It's always about amplifying the voices and stories of, of the other people. Yeah. Yeah, amazing though. Can you believe it, Angela? I can because I could. <laughs> Whilst I'm talking about that, people often say to me, because we work so independently, freelancers, self-employed people, we work by ourselves for a whole lot of the time. <laughs> so it's very hard to see the impact that one's work has. And um, I, I sometimes forget that people have any idea of who I am. So when people go, Oh, you're Carolyn Mendelssohn. I'm going, yeah, yeah. And and so being a Nikon ambassador was always surprising to me because I only see myself sitting by myself, sweating over my laptop, worrying about have I got the right equipment? Did I take powerful pictures? What's the next assignment? So it's really nice to step back and think, oh, well, like all that hard work has paid off. Yeah. You know, it's, we we kind of working together. All the stuff about me not being afraid to step into areas that feel bigger than me has worked for me. Yes, taking those bold moves. Yeah. It also is a really nice endorsement of your photography. Oh, it's so lovely. And, it's, you know, what I really love is that they are appreciative of my kind of portraiture. The fact that I'm not a big news reporter. Oh, you know, I know I do work for Bloomberg, but it's very specifically portraits but that they really like the kind of work I do. Because obviously we're used to seeing there's some amazing landscape and wildlife photographers. They are phenomenal. So it's really nice that Nikon embraces all sorts of different genres. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, it is great. So we've come to the section called Six from She Clicks, and I have got 10 questions from She Clickers, and I would like you to answer six of them, please. So if you could give me a number from one to 10. Three, please. Three. Okay. Right. It's about your project being in between. It was very successful and brought you lots of recognition, as we've already mentioned. But has it been difficult to move on from that? And do you feel more pressure to succeed because of it? That question is from Marianne. Oh, no, not. It hasn't been difficult to move on at all, actually. Um, yeah, it won because I, or one, obviously I'm royal today. <laughs> I became known for that piece of work, but, but it hasn't stopped me from developing new projects. And obviously people maybe see that and don't see the other work that I'm doing. So um, I've done some really exciting art commissions. I've, I've, I'm working on a very long form project at the moment that's taken me a couple of years to, to, to start to happen, which I can't really talk about. Um, it what it did give me is the knowledge that I can do something over a long period of time and that I shouldn't worry what other people think about it and that it moves me on to different areas. But that's a good question because, I, you know, I, I think people will always say, what are you doing? What projects are you working on? Yeah. But I'm doing lots of work and doing lots of projects, but I can't always talk about them until they're half done. I look forward to finding out. Okay, so can we have another question then, please? That was number three. Could I have number seven, please? Number seven. Oh, do you prefer to shoot in the studio where you have full control over everything or outdoors where things can be a bit more variable? That's from Rebecca. Rebecca, believe it or not, I love outdoors. It's so funny. People see me as, as this kind of studio photographer because of the, I guess, again, going back, because of the kind of success of being in between, people see me as that studio photographer. I always, I always started on location. I love the location. I love natural light. And I love the variety. I mean, I've just done this piece called Hardy and Free, which was commissioned for the Bronte Parsonage Museum. And that was Women in Landscape. What a joy. I did... You know, I thought, well, I could bring all my lights with me, but actually, let's just use what is there. And so it's joyful for me to be in amazing landscapes and environments and take portraits within that, tell those women's stories, but also be more playful. I think that was a, a, 
a great opportunity for me not to over plan but to respond creatively and artistically so yeah so I actually love outside I love location work okay I could have another number then please could I have number one number one okay when you try to capture the authenticity of a person and you, you spoke about this earlier how do you make them relax so you can create an image that you know they're comfortable with and it's got their personality in it so I think that's a brilliant question because I think we probably can all relate to that feeling of being really uncomfortable in front of a camera very few people feel very comfortable in front of the camera so I'm, I'm very aware of that what I tell people if I feel they're particularly worried is I just want them to enjoy the experience I'll say let's enjoy the experience trust me I've got the camera don't worry about whether you're photogenic or not let's enjoy this adventure together let's enjoy this time together I want to find out about them so really 80% of my job is enabling people to feel happy in their skin and to forget that I'm taking the picture. And I sometimes do little mini directions. I might ask somebody to move their head a little. I involve them in the process. So I look at it as a collaborative, a collaboration when I'm taking that picture. We're working together, but I want them not to worry about how they are looking because that's my job as the photographer. Right. And actually, you're the best person to assess it, aren't you, from that position? Because they only ever see a, a mirror reflection of themselves. Yeah, that's right. Do you use things like eye detection or set the electronic shutters? I always used to use spot focus. And it's only recently that I've started to use or that I've trusted eye detection. But I'm still composing that portrait with them. And interestingly, I've very recently had a really exciting assignment and the person um, who was feeling very uncomfortable about how they're represented photographically, um, because they're always being photographed and they're never in control of it. So I was working collaboratively with them. So I did use eye detection, um, but I'm quite happy to use eye detection or, or spot focus. But also I put my new cameras, I can make the shutter really, well, there isn't a shutter. Is there? No, there is a shutter. You know what I mean, don't you? Uh, the, the sound. It's an electronic one. Yes. Yes. It's not mechanical. Electronic shuffle. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, exactly. Thank you. you. You you can kind of fill people in on the technical. So <laughs> I put it on. So it was very quiet. I could hear it, but she couldn't. And she said, oh, I love the fact. I don't know whether you've taken a picture or not. And that was interesting for me because... I love a good old shutter sound personally, mm. but it was really eye-opening to have a, a subject I was taking a picture of say, actually, she loved that she didn't know. Yeah, I can see that being quite an advantage. It only just occurred to me that actually sometimes when, you know, you take a shot and there's a clack of a mirror and a, and a shutter going, then some people say, oh, I think my eyes were shut. And you can't then take the next couple of frames because they're busy saying, I, I think my eyes were shut. So, you know, if they don't know, they're not going to say that. So just struck me yeah okay would you like to pick another number i would like to pick nine number nine okay how do your photo projects germinate from ideas to fruition are you quick to act or does it take time for the idea to mature and that question's from liz i think there are two ways of thinking about it so um sometimes it, it's very quick like when i was doing keepers which was the trades people that was a very simple idea a bigger project like being in between, interestingly, it was almost fully formed in my head, which is kind of bizarre, isn't it? I could, I almost like could see that work and it was almost meant to happen. And it was very simple. It was like girls wearing clothes of their choice, being asked questions about their lives, having their portrait with the same backdrop, having the same the instruction. I wanted them to be looking into the camera because I wanted to turn that whole thing about being the subject of a, a picture on its head, that they look at us. Um, and I wanted to use the same backdrop because I took it over a number of years. So that was very simple in some ways, even though hmm. the, the kind of stories and everything are quite multi-layered. So um, another project I'm working on at the moment, I've been spending a couple of years, I'm doing lots of research. I know what I want to do. But it involves lots. It involves looking at archives. It, it involves creating a new studio. It involves lots of different 
levels and layers to it. So that one is is kind of incubating and it has incubated over a long period of time whilst whilst I'm working on getting partners for it. So it's a mixture, Some, sometimes instantly, sometimes an idea is almost fully formed. And then other times I'm working quite a long time and germinating that idea. I love that word germinating or incubating. It's good. Good answer. So it, it really depends. So uh, can I have your fifth number, please? Number eight. Number eight. How do you split your time between commercial work and personal projects? That's another from Rebecca. What I do now, I'm in a really fortunate position of feeling like a lot of my commercial work is personal work. So it's almost like I feel like my artisan residence work, even though that is going to be used, is a commission, feels very personal. My art commission, Hardy and Free, felt like me being an artist, which it was really. I'm also getting grant funding for some project work. So I, the way I get income is multi-layered. So sometimes it is a mixture. But at the moment, I did a big participation project called Through Our Lens, which you might remember because we talked about yep. it, which was enabling young people to tell their own story through photography. And that ended up getting lots of funding. So sometimes I will, I don't want to just do com- kind of the commercial stuff. And if I do commercial work, as I was saying, it's really important to me that it resonates and it tells stories in the way that I do as an independent artist. So um, I'd say it's half, half, but it kind of feels like I'm doing all, um, it weirdly feels like I'm doing lots of personal work, but it's actually not. It's just the work that people like is the work that I do for personal projects. So therefore I start to get commissioned to do it. Yeah. What a great position to be in though, because I mean, they always say, Say if you're a wedding photographer and you want to shoot black and white weddings, don't put any colour stuff on your, your website because people will come to it. You end up shooting stuff you don't want and you've put your personal work out there and people have come to you for something similar. So uh, fantastic. Yeah, the pandemic really helped me kind of real focus in on what brought me joy, what I wanted to do. And I think things changed dramatically for me because I started to really put lots of energy into work that was meaningful to me and then sharing that work as you were saying um, meant that people started to just ask for the work that I had developed myself. Yeah yeah I think as, as terrible as the pandemic was it did make a lot of us sort of sit down and think about what we you know a lot of us weren't doing a great deal of work and what we did want to do when, when we came through it and what was going to be the next step so um, yeah it, it was kind of uh, quite an important phase to go through although it was pretty traumatic at the time. Okay, so your your final number, please. Oh, I think I'm going to go for number two. Okay. What do you think of the AI revolution? <gasps> this is from Carmen. Oh, <laughs> oh, Carmen, AI. Well, you know, AI's actually been around for a long time, hasn't it? So in a, in a small way. Mm-hmm. But what's happened is it's moving so quickly. And I see people using AI and t- talking about themselves as creators. Um, whereas often I think people we'll say a few prompts and then then AI, that, that a mid-journey or whatever will create an amazing picture and they'll, they'll claim to be the creators of that image. But actually, it worries me that many people's work has been scraped off the internet by certain AI companies. It does worry me massively. I also find there's a sort of 1980s science fiction feel to a lot of AI pictures that I see, which feels quite weird. Um, I think that if you're a documentary photographer, if you're a wedding photographer, if you're a portrait photographer, mm-hmm. then you're okay because you're. it's about real people. We're going to have to embrace it, but I think there needs to be some way of managing it because it's moving so quickly. I had actually, can I just share this? I had a nightmare. This tell this will tell you how how much I think about it. I woke up one morning and then I went back to sleep and then I dreamt that I woke up and then this this man and all these other people walked into my bedroom and they were AI people. <laughs> and they were like wanting to take over my camera, wanting to take over they were like zombies, AI zombies, there's no soul behind them. That terrified me. Obviously, it's on my mind. Clearly. Good grief. Yes, obviously, we've stirred up something there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is worrying. AI is incredibly useful when it's applied to autofocus systems, but 
you know, it's, it's the other side of it, like you say, it does cause a few worries. And I think we don't really know where it's going to go or how useful or not it's going to be at the moment. It's very much a, a discovery phase, isn't it? I think so. And there's ju- there's an excitement about it, which I understand absolutely. Mm-hmm. I just think it it's moved so quickly, hasn't it? So maybe that, that concerns me, the way it's moving so quickly becomes out of our control yeah but obviously photography has changed dramatically from the moment the first camera was made so i think we just need to be mindful and kind of hopeful that we can work with it rather than against it yeah well carolyn it's been absolutely wonderful as always to chat with you thank you so much for joining me on today's podcast thank you so much for listening everybody and and thanks for the brilliant questions as well been really lovely way to spend time oh thank you thanks for listening to this episode of the she clicks women in photography podcast i hope you enjoyed it you'll find links to carolyn's website and social media channels in the show notes i'll be back with another episode soon so please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and tell all your friends and followers about it you'll also find she clicks on facebook twitter instagram and youtube if you search for she clicks net so until next time Enjoy your photography.